Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Pat Harrington, and I have had the pleasure of taking students to Uganda three times. And it is an amazing place, and everything that everyone has said about it just reinforces for me the way I feel about it. It's awesome. And this afternoon, I am honored to introduce our guest speaker. I've known Dr. Kellerman since 2012 when he was here visiting the campus. In 2001, Dr. Kellerman and his wife, Carol, um, began their service as medical missionaries in Uganda, where they have significantly improved the health of the local Batwa pygmy population, who in 1993 were displaced when their tribal forest became a World Heritage Site for the protection of the mountain gorillas. The Batwa would soon become one of the most impoverished peoples of the world. Scott and Carol were also instrumental in founding Windy Community Hospital, five times rated the best performing hospital in Uganda. I think Jane, Jane said six, so I trust her information over mine. And the Uganda Nursing School in Windy, an advanced center of learning combining excellence and compassion. In 2014, Scott and Carol were among the 51 highly compassionate individuals honored as unsung heroes of compassion by His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. Through their loving kindness and service to others, they have made their communities and our world a better place. In addition, Dr. Kellerman has received one of the highest honors bestowed by Rotary International, the Rotary Service Above Self Award for Exemplary Humanitarian Service. A longtime family practitioner in Nevada City, California, and a former chief of staff at Sierra Nevada Medical Center, Dr. Kellerman continues to travel to Uganda, providing medical care and raising funds for the Batwa population. Over the years, his efforts have served more than 120,000 people. Most recently, he has been awarded an eight to 10 month Fulbright to work back in Uganda, specifically with Jane, the director of the Windy Nursing School. And I have to say that it really touches my heart that Dr. Kellerman says nurses are so critically important to the health of the population. You don't get that here that often. <laughs> so when you read the materials, I'm going, nursing is number two here on all the work that he's done. So Jane, you've done a really good job. <laughs> Thank you so very much. We are very grateful he's here with us and very grateful for the many opportunities that our students have had to work with him. So thank you. Thanks, Pat. Good to see you. <laughs> thank you, Pat. Is this got some feedback? Is that okay? Maybe I'll move over here. Um, actually, I got the Fulbright, Pat, uh, before you sit down. She's one of my mentors, and that's the reason I have this Fulbright, so thanks. <laughs> we work with the Batwa Pygmies of Southwest Uganda, and these are what Batwa look like. The hunter-gatherers that were kicked out of the forest in 1993 when it was made a world heritage site in order to protect the mountain gorillas. Not everybody in there is, uh, is a Batwa Pygmy. There's a guy named Steve in the back. And he came over with, um, for a two-week project and stayed five years. So watch out for those short-term projects. This is what Mother Teresa said. I'm sure you're familiar with that expression. Where did Mother Teresa said was the poorest place she'd ever visited? The most poverty-stricken. Do you know? It's just to the east of Scranton. New York. Yeah, because people are forgotten there. They're not forgotten where we work. The clan, the tribe are very tight. There's no social network like Medicaid or Social Security, so people support one another. If you come to Africa, and I, I'm going to encourage you to do it, you are not a stranger. You may be a stranger in New York City riding the subway, but you are not a stranger if you come to these places. If you come, one of the requirements is bring your dancing shoes. Um, we dance all the time, and for good report, all the folks from Scranton um, are good dancers, and that's really important. Right, Hannah? You did some dancing. <laughs> 
There's a little video about the initial work there at the Buindi. Only a fraction of a degree from the equator, in the center of Africa, is the country of Uganda. Home to some of the most welcoming people and diverse landscapes the world has to offer. Winston Churchill called it the Pearl of Africa. In the southwest corner of the country is a piece of forest that managed to survive the last ice age. This area became a world heritage site in the early 90s to protect the magnificent but greatly endangered mountain gorilla. Unfortunately, we forgot about a marginalized, unloved, and understudied group of aboriginal people that are relatives to us all. Only a few years ago, the Batwa Pygmies were abruptly evicted from their homeland, left with nothing. When we first arrived, um, actually Robin had asked me about a little history of how we came to Uganda. Um, I, I worked in Nepal, my family and I worked in Nepal for several years, two and a half years, and just had a wonderful time. I had a kid that was born there, and, and when we came back to the United States, uh, the idea was you know, we're going to work someplace in the world every summer. My wife was afraid of Africa primarily because of subspecialty in tropical diseases. And my wife and I read to each other in the evening, and one evening I was reading to her um, about a disease called Noma. I know you heard about that, but it's when the mouth bacteria will invade the face and eat away the face within a few weeks. It carries about an 80% mortality. The 20% that survive need major plastic surgery. So I showed her all these pictures of Noma, snapped the book closed, and said, hey, you love, let's go to Africa, all the best diseases are there. And she clutched our one-year-old to her chest and said, you'll never get me to Africa. So we went to Nepal, back to Nepal, went to South America, Central America, and one year we're looking where to go the next summer, and there was an opportunity to do a medical survey on the Batwa Pygmies. And we went over for that summer, uh, six weeks, and after two weeks my wife said, I feel like I've come home. And then after a month, she over dinner, she says, I think we need to pray about it because I think when we go home, we should sell everything and, and come back and help these people out. So for my wife, you know, blow me or a follower anywhere. And that's essentially what we did. Uganda's got some of the greatest biodiversity on the face of the planet. There are more species of plants, animals. Um, this fellow, a friend of mine, Andy Wright, up in the left-hand corner, he says, I wonder if those lions bite. Um, <laughs> And actually, it's a, it's a magic of Photoshop. He's in a tree and they're in a tree, but thankfully not the same one. We had a medical student from UCSF, University of California, San Francisco. Very intelligent, but not very smart. You know, you may know people like that. And his question was, I wonder if I can get that bull hippo to charge. And he could, but the real problem is that hippos kill more people in sub-Saharan Africa than all other animals combined. Bigmies are very diminutive, only about four and a half feet in height, and produce little bitty babies. When we first did a medical survey in the year 2000, the results were pretty overwhelming. 38% were dying of kids were dying before the age of five. Essentially, four in ten would not see their fifth birthday. Compared to 18% of Ugandans and 0.8% here in the U.S., and the reason is just abject poverty. Average life expectancy, all considered, was the age of 28, annual income of only $25 a year. When we first arrived, there was no health care delivery in the country. Um, I was only doc for about a quarter million people, and, and my wife's a teacher, and there wasn't much in the way of education. So we spent the first couple of years living in a tent, traveling around, learning the language, culture, and traditions. And it was interesting. I mean, it, was, it took some getting used to, of course. Um, we were living large in California. I was um, at a medical practice. We had a couple of homes, and some friends of mine had bought a hospital, and we were trying to run that. And I was chief of staff at the main hospital in town, and um, I was involved with church work and rotary. And my wife was um, getting a degree in San Francisco. We were like ships passing in the night. So we kind of unloaded everything and then moved in a tent together for a couple of years. You know, we fell in love. And so I'd encourage any of you guys out there that have got any little interpersonal stuff going on, to forget with that counseling, just, you know, sell everything, live in a tent together for a couple of years in the developing world. It's a sure path to marital bliss. 
Say I was only docked there for, you know, quite an area. Patients just be carried in. We'd see them just alongside the road, hoping that somebody would come help. Our main, main medical intervention, as Jane mentioned, was under a tree. We would just pull up with our uh, Land Rover and uh, carry our medical supplies to the nearest ficus tree, big old fig tree, and we'd hang IVs in the branches of trees, sometimes tying them up with vines. All these IVs are dripping into kids that have cerebral malaria, which is universally fatal if untreated. When we arrive, always unannounced, you hear the drums go out and you hear them go off to the village and just keep going off in the distance, and then people start trickling in. But we'd see 200, 300, sometimes 500 people a day. Um, and we did this at every place we went. Where do you go? What to do? Uh, this is a typical conveyance in Sub-Saharan Africa, and regardless of how it looks, it's not safe. Be careful. We, um, my wife and I, I, you know, we'd like to say, you know, it's been this steady trajectory of, you know, success, success after success, but that's not the case. It's, um, it was really hard. We had a lot of challenges and a huge number of failures. Um, we were dealing with a people group. They were hunter-gatherers and lived in a scarcity mentality. We tried animal husbandry, did this participatory development we all read about and got them involved, did several months of work with them, got them a goat or got them some chickens and, you know, those chickens and goats, they were on a spit just almost immediately, I cook them up. We did agricultural projects, we get them hoes. We teach them how to hoe the land, how to till the soil, how to plant the seeds, how to water it and tend it and then they could have a crop finally get them seeds and um, get them seeds and then we come back a couple of days later and nothing is done. They'd eaten all the seeds. One of the commonest questions we got asked when we first arrived in Uganda is, you're from America. And we say, America. They said, uh, do Americans have food to eat every day? So they were in a scarcity mentality. So we had a lot of failures uh, and actually zero successes for a couple of years. And we're invited to a missions conference in Nairobi. And the moderator um, asked you know, the missionaries to give oh, kind of testimonies to talk about your successes. And, and we knew some people there. They had some PowerPoint presentations. Things were looking good. Came time for my wife and I to give a talk. And we didn't have any photo ops. We had nothing, nothing to take a picture of. And the guy said, you've been here a couple of years and you haven't done anything? I, yeah, that's yeah, true. Um, and what have you accomplished? And I could only think of two things. I love my wife more, and I felt like I could put my full weight down on Jesus Christ and, and for all our needs. And the moderator, who was a pastor dude, he says, is that all? And I said, yeah, but I thought it was a lot. I was real pleased with that. <laughs> but then I went back to the Buindi. Carol and I went back, and we kind of spiraled down. Why were these other missionaries hitting home runs and were nothing but strikeouts? What was going on? Why had we been blessed with any success? And we kind of got a little depressed. And then we heard about some elderly missionaries, these elderly couple that had been in Sub-Saharan Africa for four or five decades, and they were coming to trek the mountain gorillas. We live where the mountain gorillas are. And we invited them to dinner. And over dinner, the old guy asked me, he says, how you doing? And I thought he wanted to know. And so I just <laughs> laid out one complication after another that we'd had all the failures. And after he Heard enough. He finally got our attention and said the words that really rocked us. He said, do you think God has called you to be successful or has he called you to be faithful? And it's still, uh, <laughs> even today it rocks me. Because we had been called to be with people. All the projects we had were, I mean, these people were dying. They needed help. But all the projects were Western models superimposed on an African tradition. No wonder they failed. So you heard the thing, get, away, you know, get out of the way and let, let go and let God. And we said, backed off. And we said, okay, God, if you called us to be here, we'll try and listen to you. But if we'll say all these projects, if they're successful, you get the glory. And if they're unsuccessful, you got big shoulders to cry on. And, and so we said, okay. That's the way it's going to work. And it started working. 
We broke ground in 2003 for an outpatient clinic, that's on the right, and then a maternity care unit down in the lower part. And the reason for the maternity care unit is the maternal death rate in rural Uganda at that time was 880 maternal deaths per 100,000 live births. If you do the math, for every 113 live births, a mother had a tendency to die in pregnancy, some of the highest maternal mortality on the planet. So our focus then and is now is on maternal and child health. Now we have a at 130 bed hospital, full service hospital. If you came over in 2006, this is a change from the few couple of buildings that you, we had here before. And it is a full service hospital. We're offering esoteric surgery, vesicovaginal fistula repair, cataract repair. We're doing a lot of things. We just double the size of the operating theater. We increase the size of the uh, surgical ward. This is our pediatric ward. Every day in the pediatric ward, the drums come out and we have singing and dancing. Do you do that at your local institution? Um, it's very therapeutic. Even though we're in the road, we treat some of the sickest of the sick and we do have a neonatal ICU, even though we have to uh, produce all our own energy, all our own electricity. And we have consultants that come from all over. This is our dental unit, and actually a friend of mine, Barry Turner, and uh, we have dentists that come and help. We have a, a, a dental officer there who uh, runs the unit, and this is a fellow, he, he left the hospital a lot long ago, but uh, named Jackson, and Jackson got so good at pulling teeth, he got the name of Extraction Jackson. <laughs> and Jackson could pull any tooth for 15 cents, so his, his, his suggestion for you all is for the money, the change in your pocket or your purse, you can come over and have as many teeth pulled as you need. Now Jackson was still a little light on the anesthesia, but he guarantees me he would get that tooth out. <laughs> Golly, what's this? Any guys, non-Ugandans, have any idea why 12 to 15 percent of these kids are lo missing their lower canines? It's something called Ebino. It's done by the traditional healers, the Abafumu, the witch doctors. And when kids under age one get dehydrated, the gums start recede, and the tooth buds will show. They take a razor blade, and they will pull out the lower incisors. And that, that stage, they're real soft. They call them Nzoka, the worm. They, we remove the worm. And the result is these kids end up snaggle tooth or like that. So the previous head of our foundation, Gene Creasy, who's a dentist, um, actually, I met with the head of NYU Dental School yesterday. They're going to help out too. Is try to address this and try to prevent this infant oral mutilation. Primarily working with the Abafumu, the witch doctors. This is our maternal unit. One of the things that the women requested was a waiting mother's hostel. The reason is that women, there's no public transportation there. They all have to walk. And if a woman's pregnant and got a complication of current pregnancy, goes into labor in a village and walks to our hospital, she will not do well. Sometimes it takes a day or two to walk. So the waiting ho mother's hostel was built for these women. $1.25 for the whole stay, where they stay a few days, a few weeks, a couple of months. There's a communal kitchen, there's communal laundry. They get education, and right next door they have access to either cesarean section or normal delivery. And the result is the delivery rate's gone up quite dramatically, and the death rates drop precipitously, well over 60%. If you ask yourself, why are kids not immunized? Why do they not have access to health? Why do they not have access to education? Why is their land insecurity? Why is their food insecurity? The reason is poverty. So this is the bottom of ICD-10 classification of disease. Extreme poverty. And the real problem is, I'm a doc, my wife's a teacher, and hospital and schools is really not, they needed water systems, they needed housing, they needed land, they needed all these areas that we would got, you know, agricultural projects that just stretched us in ways we never thought were possible. These kids have marasmus, and I've seen, anybody seen, well, besides Jane, Jane knows Marasmus, but Marasmus comes from the Greek word meaning wither. And you can see these kids have withered. This is, um, this is my wife, refeeding program. And this kid's got kwashiorkor. And you see the color of the hair, the red hair. Africans typically don't have red hair. But you see kids with red hair, they tend to swell up, they get edema. 
We have a feeding program. We also have a program where the women work. We teach them agricultural techniques. So the women come with the babies, we treat the kids, and we teach the mothers how to dig in a field, what to plant, beans, maize meal. We have a kitchen in our uh, malnutrition unit. And, uh, and this is what the kids look like before they go home. The result of all this education is the kids typically are not readmitted and their siblings do better just because of education. I always thought, you know, how do you deal with poverty? Isn't it such an overwhelming thing with kids are in stage starvation? Poverty subtends a lot of areas, and one of them is poverty of knowledge. The women did not know what to feed their kids. The staple of, of Uganda is something called matoke, which is a green banana that they cook whatever little nutrition out of it, and that's the staple. Another kid, a kid comes along, the one that was under breast gets booted off, gets put on matoke, and three or four months later, he's in a malnutrition unit. Ah, question for you all. Why is the use of cell phones promoted 1,500 excess civilian deaths in the Congo per day? 5.5 million over the last dozen, 15 years. What, what about a cell phone? Yes? How do you know that? Golly, I just, anyway, I just finished speaking at NYU and I was Mayo Clinic before that. Nobody knows the answer. You guys are smart here, right? Yeah. It is coltan or tantalite. It's a mineral mined in eastern Congo. It's, it's a metaphor. It's a conflict mineral. Uh, it's gold, blood diamonds, you know, all that. And the result of that is refugees. We see refugees come over periodically. This particular time, I guess 20, 25,000 came across. I went over there to help. Uh, the real problem with the refugees is we started noticing a, a diarrheal disease, rice water stools. Do you know a diarrhea that causes rice water stools? Called cholera. The cholera started outbreak. Impure water source. We had water. We had a water and sanitation project going. We brought over the water. The rotary guys did, um, had hydrologists, and we found a clean water source, and the epidemic was averted. So we talk about. Pat's invited me to speak on Monday about HIV. The world's burden of HIV is in Sub-Saharan Africa. 25 million people HIV positive. One of the biggest problems, as Jane was mentioning, is mother-to-child transmission of HIV. Both this mother and child are wasted. Both have AIDS. We have a counseling program. That's Dr. Brunji up on the right. He just he came and visited just before Jane came uh, here in the United States. We have an active counseling program. Statistics show if a mother is HIV positive, anywhere between 15 to 45 percent of the offspring will be HIV positive. If untreated, 50% of those kids will be dead by the age of two. Horribly devastating. If you give any retroviral drugs to the mother, last part of pregnancy, early part of breastfeeding, treat the kid first year of life, you can reduce that from 15 to 45% to less than 2%. And as James mentioned, we've gone several years without one kid being HIV positive. HIV in, pre HIV in childhood is a preventable illness. No reason any kid in the world needs to have HIV. Here's an HIV positive lady who's happy because her kid is negative. And as Jane mentioned about her HIV unit, the neat thing about that HIV unit is that there's no waiting on the outside. They're all seen inside because HIV has a stigma attached to it. So they have education in there. They're taught about how to live a healthy life with HIV. We have expert patients who go out to the village and talk to the villagers about it. They bring in people who need to be tested. We test over 1,000 people a month. There's consultation rooms. There's a pharmacy. There's a, um, there's a lab there where, they, where we can send out. We can do CD4 counts and send out viral loads. This little child sadly had neonatal uh, tetanus and did not survive. Um, I was talking to Cyrus. Where he is? Is he around? Uh, yeah. About he's, Cyrus is going to be lecturing to... Um, uh, first responders, essentially, a uh, trauma case. You can't cure sometimes, and, and sometimes you can't even treat, but you can always comfort. You teach that here, right? Comfort. It's amazing compassion, comfort, mercy, how therapeutic it is. Ooh, got some more questions. You guys, you're all nurses, right? You know all these questions, the answers to this. Uganda, a couple of years ago, had some uh, hippos floating down the river, dead, you know, feet up. And um, villagers thought they looked pretty tasty. 
carved them up, cooked them up. Uh, what's the number one bioterrorism weapon that everybody worries about? Starts with an A. Anthrax. That's cutaneous anthrax. They got intestinal anthrax. Pulmonary anthrax is almost universally fatal if not treated, if not diagnosed. Treated with ciprofloxacin, but uh, quite a few Ugandans um, died from eating uh, those dead hippos. So take home message, see a flo floating hippo down and down and out, leave it, okay? Don't cook them up. Ooh, another good question. You guys know that one? What is it? What? It's the guinea worm. It's Trichunculus mediensis. It's an interesting worm, interesting life cycle. It's usually related to step wells where you walk into the well and the female worm dumps the larva in the water. They invade something called a, a uh, cyclops, a little crustacean. You go drink the water, the larva breaks out, goes through your intestinal tract male and female mate in your peritoneal cavity, and then it migrates down your lower extremity. And when you walk out into the water, there comes a female worm ready to complete the life cycle. The ancient treatment is to take a stick and roll it out on it. it takes hours to a day or so to get the worm out, careful not to break it. That's the origin of what medical symbol? Caduceus. Also, if you biblical scholars, Numbers 21, Moses in the desert, the fiery serpents. And, you know, they put up the statue of the fiery serpent. Many people think they were talking about Dracunculus mediensis of the guinea worm. This is Jimmy Carter's campaign. You heard about that guy, uh, Fuller, earlier. That He was from America's real close to Plains, Georgia, where Jimmy Carter was raised. But Jimmy Carter did this campaign. 3.5 May in 86, 22 cases um, here in 15. It's quite extraordinary. It's, it's, that, that worm will be wiped out. Ooh, got some other ones. Northern Uganda, 5-10% of the population, 5 to 8% of the population is blind from this disease. Associated with the river. River Rhine. Blindness. Yeah, river Rhine blindness. Yeah. It's transmitted by this fly called Simulium damnosum. Interesting name. And uh, creates the skin lesions called leopard legs. Uh, but also it has these oncocircle nodules, migrates up to the eye. You see the blind guy is being led, or, led around by a sighted adolescent. Inside these no nodules are the macrofilaria, but the microfilaria go up to the eyes and call this sclerosing keratitis. Treated by a drug called ivermectin. All right, disease first noted in 1947 in Uganda. In the name of the forest was Zika forest, that's right. First isolated there, migrated down to French Polynesia, finally made it, you know, soccer team came over and played in Brazil, took it over to Brazil. Somehow the virus mutated, became more pathogenic, teratogenic, and caused, you know, microcephaly that we've read about. Um, turns out in Uganda there's no higher prevalence of microcephaly. It was, it was primarily primate mosquito primate life cycle, not much in the human. Ooh, okay, this one, um, came to Dallas a couple of years ago. This is transmitted by gorillas, primates of the, of the reservoir, or fruit bats. That disease would be called, named after a river in the Congo. Anyway, huh? Ebola, yeah, Ebola. It's, um, it's endemic. Uh, before Ebola struck Sierra Leone and Liberia, that in some areas north of there where they had lowland gorillas, in some, in some areas 90% of the lowland gorillas died from Ebola. So if you see the mountain gorillas or lowland gorillas start keeling over, you probably ought to vacate. Um, there's a study now called a PREDICT study done by through University of California Davis, $100 million project to go study novel infections in primates to see what, next, what the next epidemic will be. I spoke at Colorado State in their veterinary school, and they said, ah, UC Davis is way behind. What they do is they take a vacuum cleaner into these villages right next to the, to the forest, and they'll suck up the mosquitoes, kind of hoover them up, and then they'll do PCR on the blood of the mosquito. And they said, the study had been only going three months when I talked with them. They said they have already, already discovered five novel viruses that are already in the human population. They also diagnosed some cases of HIV from the mosquito. Mosquitoes can't treat, uh, can't transmit HIV. 
but then tell the public health officer, somebody in that house, uh, you need to go and, and test up. That's Ebola. One of the big killers of kids under age five is diarrheal disease. This is a typical water source, and this is the result. Sanitation. These are all the public health measures that are very simple and not very, not very complicated and not very expensive. So we got Rotary, I'm a Rotarian, and uh, we did clean water projects, real simple. It was um, uh, rainwater catchment, like see, and simple, simple um, and catchment of, uh, of springs, essentially uh, upper left. And the result is when you do these simple projects in pit latrines and, and a little animal husbandry, but it was mainly water and sanitation. We went around to the village, it was a three-year project. It took seven and a half years to complete because we spent two and a half years sensitizing, getting committees that were willing to take care of it, willing to do all the work, and willing to maintain them and have a sustainable project. And the result is the diarrhea rates presenting to our outpatient units dropped over 50% from these simple measures. Now, the hospital doesn't affect the health of the community. And you, you, you kind of wonder why. The reason is that hospitals treat the sickest of the sick. Much better to prevent malaria than treat. Much better to prevent diarrhea than treat. Much better to prevent than HIV than treat. Because most of these diseases are expensive to treat and cheap to prevent. So I'd encourage any of you all that are going to the developing world, maybe even working in Scranton, to get involved with some public health thing. Because, uh, you, I mean, if you can prevent an illness rather than treat it, you're way ahead of the game. Whew. <laughs> this is an Amafumu, traditional healer, actually representing a, a god called Nabinji. Years ago, we had, uh, I had a friend of mine from Tulane Med School, where I graduated from, he, he and I were classmates, and he came out and he said, uh, can you work with the Amafumu? And the Amafumu, which doctors, I said, ah, I, mean, I can't work with those guys, said they do all these weird things. They make cuts in the skin and put herbs in it. They, on young children, they will take hot, hot implements and, and burn over the areas that they think are infected, kind of drawn out the poisons of the evil spirits. They will do that tooth extraction that you saw. And then incantations and spells. So, ah, yeah, I can't work with them. He said, you know, since I've been here, I've done a little study. 90% of your patients are seeing the Abafumu before they come and see you. He said, you say you can't work with them. I'm telling you, you cannot not work with them. So we invited them to our house one day, and about 50 of them showed up in all their traditional garb and went around the room introducing ourselves. And they had the subspecialties. You know, they gave them a name and their subspecialty lightning strikes, malaria, potency, women's issues. It was pretty interesting. And then uh, I asked them, I said, uh, You have any trouble working with me? And they said, We think you're going to be judgmental. And I said, You're right on that one. Uh, but I will try and hold judgment. Um, and then one Abafumu stood up and he said, what do you think about our practices of Omariro, the burning, or Kushara, the cutting, or Bino, the teeth? What do you think about our practices? What do you say? You can't support it and kind of deer in the headlights time. And this old lady stood up in the corner of the room. She was really whizzing. Walk with a stoop and it came when she stood up the room just got this death like silence to it. Come up, blood ran cold. The guy next to me goes, That's Batuza. Batuza was the most powerful Abafu in a valley. With a curse you would die. I'd seen patients come in the outpatient unit. What's the matter with you? Well, Batuza cursed me and it was kind of wither away. So Batuza stands up, works away over to this guy who'd asked me the question put her hands on his shoulder, put him in a seat, and looked around the room and said, we're going to talk about what we have in common, not our differences. Can you imagine if the world operated that way? So we started talking about commonality. And one of the commonalities was, well, now we have, we have 500 and over 500 village health promoters. Many of them are these abafumu. There are eyes and ears and feet on the ground, each one responsible to 20 to 25 ha households. Initially, TB therapy, eight months of TB therapy, we had about 56% of our patients comply with eight months of TB therapy. Compared to the national average of 53, ah, a little better than the national average. 
you know, felt pretty good about it. But since working with this Village Health Promoters, our compliance rate is over 97%, some of the highest in East Africa. And they help us with immunization campaigns. One of the first projects we took on with the Abafumu was a malaria. The kid on the right has cerebral malaria and actually only lived about half an hour after the photo was taken. Malaria involves the red cells, so they lysis the red cells. They become se severely anemic, which is the reason that kid's getting a transfusion. So we were around trying to distribute bed nets. We had some bed nets, and we went around talking to people about them. They said, ah, bed net will not work. We said, well, why not? And they said, because malaria is caused by stan. Stun. Stun's a demon. And they said, yeah, because kids under age five, when they get malaria, can go to the brain to cerebral malaria, and kids seize, and seizures are interpreted as demon possession. So we met with the Abafumu, took them down to the hospital, showed them what it looked like, the parasite looked on, like under the microscope. Actually, this is a, this is a, Matai is a malaria smear. But it showed them what it looked like under the microscope, then showed them the life cycle of the Anopheles mosquito, and then they agreed to help us with the bed nets. But they said, you cannot give the bed nets away for free. I said, what do you mean? They said, they've got to pay for them. Are you kidding me? It's unconscionable. Here, this family, these people are, are desperately poor. And the kids under age five are dying of a preventable illness. You want to charge? He said, if you don't charge, they won't appreciate. He said, charge them a little bit, a bow or a basket, an arrow or something like that. And we agreed. So the Albafumu worked with us. We started distributing about 1,000 a month, and after we had distributed about 25 to 30,000 of them, our malaria rates dropped precipitously. And as Jane mentioned, 40% of our outpatients used to come in with a complaint of malaria. Now it's less than 4%. Reduced malaria by over 90%. Somebody asked how we pay for it. Uh, this is kind of a wrestle. Um, and the way our, we have an insurance plan now called Equality Healthcare started in 2010, and it was based on Bataka groups. Because in the middle of the AIDS epidemic, so many people were dying, so many bodies lying around, because the most expensive thing you will do in your life, well, your death, is, is die. Because every, the whole village comes to your house for the burial, and your family has to pay for it. So Bataka groups started called Bataka Twiziche, or Natives We Bury Ourselves, and for a small amount of money at the beginning of the year, uh, they would collect it, and if you died, your burial was taken care of. So we went with them and said, talked to them and said, look, you deal with death, how about health insurance? And they agreed. So they renamed a subset, Bataka Twitambiri, Natives We Heal Ourselves, and for $6 per person per year, they can come to our institution, small copay, without fear of e economic devastation. So part of my Fulbright scholarship is to go over to study the efficacy of this equality health insurance and see if it can be replicated in other areas of sub-Saharan Africa. We have now a little over 25,000 people signed up for the health insurance scheme. This is a good friend of mine, Richard Cunningham. I met him because uh, he's an interesting guy. He's a runner. He um, set the NC2A mile record, uh, four, uh, 401 mile. Uh, several years ago. I mean, long, he's older, he's 80 some odd. Went to Vietnam, picked up three Purple Hearts, a bronze and a silver star, and decides he wanted to help women with basket weaving. So he's taught some women around, including our area, how to weave high quality baskets. Some of them are out, out there in the back there, Charlie has. And they're selling them in the United States. And so I, I went around him to some of the villages. Actually, he can dance pretty well too. And so we're talking to these women's groups. And he would sit there and talk to them about the dyes, you know, improving the dyes and improving the, the patterns and tight patterns and sharp lines and all that. And then after he finished, I would go talk with the ladies. And, and I'd known these ladies for quite a while, about a decade. And so I go talk to the ladies and I'd say, oh, you ladies looking good. You know, you associate with Runji, your hair is looking good, you know. And, Every drawer, your clothes, you know, they're looking good. You got, I got a purse. What's the deal? This is uh, dovetailing what John was talking about this morning about counseling. And they said, well, um, they said, now we have money. I said, you know, you dug in the field before and, and you had money, but your husband took it and drank it. Husbands take the money and go to the bars and drink the money. 
And we said, what's different? They said, now we, we keep our money. We're sending our kids to school, we're improving our houses, and, and we're able to get some clothes and things. I said, yeah, come on. Wherever your husband wants, wants the money. They said, well, you know, we, we tell him he can't take it. I said, what happens if he takes it? He said, well, we weave together uh, two or three times a week, and we talk in a group. And if a husband takes the money, then we go to the village and we beat him up. <laughs> so it's amazing when women get together and start talking, um, how there's consequences to actions for their, for their husbands. One of the definitions of poverty is lack of options. Without an education, options are very limited. Uh, this is what we found in a school. We came in 2002. Now we got over 700 kids in school, 250 being Batwa. We try to have a garden at each of the schools, see upper right, because we found that a kid that comes to school who's hungry can't study. So every kid gets a warm meal every day. If you think you do not have a skill set that suits Africa, think again. We had an artist come over one time. And, what are you doing, artist? She liked maps. My wife liked maps. So the idea was to paint a map of the world in the back of the classroom. And so this woman right here, Abius, was on a ladder breastfeeding her kid in the upper right-hand corner, painted it up. She finished painting that. Got down the ladder, dragged it over the other side of the room, and went up to the upper left-hand corner and asked my wife, what color? My wife said, same color. So she went in the back of the room and with this 30 or 40 batwa watching this map unfold. And they talk, 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 and then she comes back up and she said, is that the same country? My wife said, sure, Russia. Went back in the room. So we went back in the room talking to the batwa, and all of a sudden the room became electric energy and they all raced forward and they said do you mean that the world is round like a pumpkin and a mosey and of course yeah the world's round and they said if the world is round what's on the inside what's on the outside we want to know teach us and that was the genesis of our adult education program so now most of our schools the kids go to a mid-afternoon they leave and the adults come in and get educated Jane mentioned this is our nursing school. Um, there's a dearth of healthcare providers. Most of them in the urban areas of four per 100,000. In Uganda docks, I was the only doc for a quarter million when I first arrived. And the same thing for nurses. The educated nurses are primarily in the cities. And that's the real gift of this nursing school is it's training nurses for rural areas. And this is what, the, you already saw that slide. If you come and teach, I encourage you to teach. All the nurses have iPads or Kindles, and we teach by smart boards. It's the same way you teach here. And we have this incredible collaborative relationship with the University of Scranton for this education. A nurse there will do a little bit more than nurses here. We think a registered nurse there could run a 15, 20-bed hospital, do all the admissions, discharge, oversee deliveries, and the minor surgeries. Um, so that's what we're expecting of the nurses. They will change the healthcare environment in southwest Uganda in collaboration with you all. All right, personal in in interest story. This is Sylvia. And Sylvia's a Mutua, a little pygmy. And we got to know Sylvia when she was 10, 12. She had birth certificates, so we weren't sure. She was living in a small hut with her mother and her, her sister. The hut was maybe five feet high, six feet long, and maybe five feet wide, made of leaves and thatch. She said, I want to go to school. So we put her in school, and she did well. She flourished. She was a good student in school. Then she went on. She was, we got a little feedback here. Should I do something? I get away from that mic. All right. So we put her in. Which way do I go? Like <laughs> rat race. So, so we put her in school, and she flourished in school. She was the first pygmy girl to go to high school. And midway through high school, ah, she met a guy. One thing led to another. She got pregnant. The guy had a family, gave her the boot. And so she and the kid kind of raced off. It took us a while. We finally located her, brought her back, got her mom to raise her kid. And then she went to university and became a university graduate. I don't know if any of you all met, her, met Sylvia. 18 months ago, she came to New York. You know New York, just east of here? She's invited to New York. And I got a son that's a lawyer there, and he took her a lot of places, pizza, elevators, escalators. Took her on top of the Empire State Building, a little elevator operator there asked questions, you know, 
where, do you, where you're from and what are you doing in our city? And I asked my son, it's my son, what do you, where are you from? He says, well, uh, I live in Brooklyn and, and I'm a lawyer in Manhattan. He goes, oh, okay. And he asked his, my, my son's wife, you know, where, what do you do? She said, he's, well, I'm a professor at Cornell. Oh, okay. Then turned to Sylvia and said, what do you do, little girl? And she said, well, I'm from Uganda. I'm a Batwa pygmy. And what are you doing in our fair city? She said, I've been invited by the United Nations to speak on indigenous rights. <laughs> Which is what she did. And she came back to Uganda. She spoke to the parliament on rights of the Batwa pygmies. And she's a spokesman. Now, when we first arrived, my wife and I were called the voice of the voiceless because the Batwa are disorganized, the Batwa pygmies. I'm saying we do that for a while, but it's not sustainable. You need to find your own voice. And this woman is a powerful voice for the Batwa. Volunteers are welcome, particularly if you happen to come from Scranton. That's a home that uh, you built for a Batwa. The homes are typically, you know, mud and wattle, tin roof, 15 feet by 15 feet, 225 square feet. The first house we built for a family, we asked them, um, you know, how many Batwa you think could be living in a house like that? They went through the little four rooms looking at them and they said, a house this magnificent, at least 15 to 20. I don't know whether the zoning codes here in Scranton would tolerate that, but imagine 225 square feet, magnificent home. And that's what you guys are doing. Uh, when you come, it's a good idea. Some uh, Americans have uh, you know, different visions of, of what the world is like, uh, particularly Sub-Saharan Africa. and. Um, but you don't. You come with your eyes open and willing to engage, right? <laughs> you recognize some of that terminology, right? <laughs> In Middle Earth down there, right? <laughs> After I've been to Uganda for a while, one of the things I do is try to work on my language skills. And one of the ways to do it is take out a little motorcycle, or ride out to the end of the road, then walk on a path, and spend a day with the Batwa in your village. And, it's, and I won't take an interpreter. It's a good way, and the kids are very forgiving and, and very nice, and I'll work on my language skills. But one time in a village, I got our villagers together, and I said, what do you, what do you like best about what we do? Yeah, hospital, homes, land, what do you like best? And the answer was Kumara Buri, which loosely translates making time or just sitting. Making relationships. I said, you're kidding me. They said, no, that, that's what we value most is, is relationships. So if you come, be ready to make relationships. If somebody says, can we sit down and have tea? The answer always should be yes. Africans, with respect to goals and things like that, do not stand in the way of a relationship. And then they went on to say, you know, do you think that the projects that you've done have any potential for success or sustainability without these relationships? It's true. I mean, that's the reason you're here. I mean, besides learning from these, you know, August Academy here, August School, but it's relationships you've built, not only among one another, but with God. That sign of the cross. So, Kamara Bui, be ready to make relationships because it is all about relationships. If you come, there's an African expression, you got an expression that Americans wear watches, but Africans have the time. So make time for those relationships. And it is true. These people are pretty desperate. And you will find, obviously, the, I don't know how God's equation works. Whatever you give comes back in you know, just an utmost measure to yourself. I don't know how God's economy works, but it's an incredible economy. I can say I've been there for, I lived there for 10 or 12 years, pretty solid. And, and I'm going back now for a better part of a year. It's been the best time of my life. Who would not like waking up to drumming and singing and dancing and going to bed the same way and then taking tea with people, building relationships, and then, oh, by the way, maybe doing some work around the side. But it's all about relationships. And we have a foundation that's helping out, too. So if you come, and I encourage you to come, be ready to engage the people at the Buindi. You've had a, quite a heritage from Charlie coming over, bringing uh, groups. They asked me one time what I've learned in Africa. I don't know if you remember, that was in 2005 or six. 
And my answer was to give up on expectations. Because a lot of the goals we have in the West will never be achieved. But the, the expectation of a relationship will always be achieved. So I encourage you to come over, build relationships, and include this relationship in the Ugandan-Scranton connection. Makama Simwe, God bless. Thank you very much. Anybody have any questions? Yes, ma'am. It's kind of a practical question. Uh, regarding the catchment, the rainwater that's caught. Yes. Uh, uh, so if, if water came off of my roof, I wouldn't want to drink it. Yeah. But I, I know it's less contaminated than, you know, the cattle waste in a yeah. pond or something. But should that water still be boiled or could that water be? No, it's fine. Yeah, it's, I mean, obviously birds poop on the roof too, and not every roof is um, made for it. The thatch roofs can't do it. It has to be a tin roof. That's the reason we're doing tin roofs and then a water catchment system. Every school we built has these big called crest tanks there to collect the water. Why in the world does only 30% of the population not have access to clean water when you're living next to a rainforest? Give me a break. I mean, this is not rocket science. Protected springs, rainwater catchment, and it gets the job done. The coliform counts are very low, so we don't, no filtration, none of that. Just drink the water and diarrhea rates just plummet and kids live. Yes? So now, eventually you had success getting people to try agriculture. What, um, what changed since the first effort? Uh, still, well, the question is about agriculture. Animal, well, I'll start with animal husbandry. We've, I don't know how much we've spent on animal husbandry, but quite a bit. We've not had one successful project. Never. No chickens. Tried chickens. They got these hawks in the Buindi that can carry off a small chimp. Bang! They hit those chickens and they're gone. So then you got a chicken coop and, uh, and then the goats the same way. They get hungry. These people are still starving. And um, agriculture has been a wrestle. How do you... All right, this is... You know, the great questions. But if you come over and you come with this guy, you will have more questions thrown at you than you will come our way with. The Batwa Pygmies and the Bachiga have an incredible culture that is very supportive. It is a tight culture. Everything is shared. 30% of the kids are orphans. There's no orphanages, and they don't need to be orphanages because everybody adopts a kid. I do not know one family of you know, people that have moved along and have a few kids that have not adopted a kid. They're so tight, and they support one another. And it says it takes a village to raise a child. That certainly you see that in no other area. I mean, I see it in Africa. So we're talking about our cultural techniques. How do you take a culture like that and then move it up to 21st century, IT, computers, Twitter, Facebook, all that, but keep these things intact? I mean, I, I personally think Africa has a ton of things to teach us about relationships. We can use it in a lot of ways. I mean, it seems like diplomacy is being less encouraged in our country these days. You all are diplomats. You are the ambassadors for University of Scranton and your school and for Jesus Christ. So our culture has been tough. You know, hunter-gatherers are not agrarian. And uh, it's difficult. So we need help. These are areas that are works in progress. I, you know, there's many things, and like I told you earlier, you know, we got called to Africa, felt like we'd be to Africa, and all these projects, you know, are, are just kind of added on. And so as a result, you know, it's, it's, it's the process rather than the outcome. And so if you come over, enjoy the process. They enjoy the process. Africans love the process, as long as you engage with them together. Whether we can ever get them... We got one settlement, one time, agriculturally pretty good, but they would never save seeds. And so we finally told them, look, uh, we can't do this, bring you seeds every year. So next year, if you don't save seeds, we're not bringing any more seeds. And if you get in trouble, you know, you just got to learn. This is not a good deal. So we came back to that settlement after they'd eaten all the seeds, and, and there was this German NGO, non-government organization, with a truck with all these seeds. We said, whoa, where'd that come from? And the Germans told us, uh, well, we heard about two missionaries that are trying to starve out the Batwa. Uh, 
So these, <laughs> these projects have not been easy. In particular, I mean, I'm not, I'm not agrarian. I flew into um, Dallas, Texas with the superintendent of our hospital, Jane Knows, and, and you know, it's a lot of open spaces. And he looked down and he said, these people must be keeper of cattle. I said, well, yeah, but they do a lot of other things besides keep cattle. But those are areas, animal husbandry and agriculture, that are difficult for me. And the reason I appreciate Pat's help, teaching is difficult for me. I'm trying to learn how to be a teacher. But we heard today that thing on Fuller, you know, how do you get stretched? I mean, can God use every part of you, even part that where you feel relatively uneducated? And my guess is, yeah. And where it's used is in Sub-Saharan Africa. Yes? Thank you very much, Doctor. I've been with a couple of doctors who have gone for the, med for the medical, medical trips in Uganda. Yeah. And um, one of the challenges we have is about the medicine. Mm. You know it very well that it is very expensive. Mm. We are faced with the problem of, we call it fake medicine from China. You know this, you have been in Uganda. So where do you get your medicine? How do you get the authentic, if I'm to use that word, medicine? Because we have a lot on sale, but it is fake. Yeah, um, the question is about medicine. And actually, um, if you want to talk about expensive medicine, live in America. We're talking about Harvoni, the drug for hepatitis C, $1,000 a tablet, $96,000 for a course of therapy. I, I, it's sinful. In Africa, we can get medicines. In America, triple therapy for HIV, $1,500 a month. We can get it for $15 a month and probably a little less. These are come out of India primarily or Kenya. We buy from a joint medical store. Catholics and Anglicans run a medical store there, and that's where we buy all our drugs in, in large quantities. So that, it's, uh, drugs, access to inexpensive drugs is not a problem. We're, we're not treating much, I mean, I can't ever remember it, treating cholesterol problems, <laughs> cholesterol issues. Most of his infectious disease, if you get a, there's, there's a drug put out by Medicine Home Frontier called Essential, Essential Drugs. It's a really good book to bring with you. And the lead, I don't know if it made it was older edition, but it said, never more than two drugs, never give it more than twice a day, never more than five days. If you're a doc, that's a, I mean, you never do that. But in Africa, simple regimes given simply for short periods of time will cure most of the diseases you will see. It's just a question whether you can diagnose it. We're trying to upgrade our labs so we can be better diagnostically. But we've not found medicines to be uh, the pinch point as far as uh, healthcare delivery. It's getting good staff on the ground. And I have to raise a lot of money. I mean, how would you run a first-rate hospital that keeps up almost pretty close to Western standards? We train residents from many of the medical centers, Mayo Clinic, UCSF, Tulane. Columbia, they come over and study with us. First-rate medical center in a resource-poor setting. Uh, it's a wrestle. So you have to, and too much is given is much required. Is that true? I think it is. Um, and if you come to Uganda, it, it costs. It costs money. It costs time. Um, it's uh, the drive down the Bawindi is rather onerous. It's about three days of travel. But again, God's equation, I think you, you know, if you have a question of giving money or coming, come. If you have extra money, then give it. But just come. Come, see, experience, and your life will never be the same. Any more questions? <laughs> I have a, a question about your relationship with the traditional healers. Yes. And uh, it sounded like uh, you learned how to, in a way, enlist them in your, in your project and then you yes. to teaching. But have you learned anything from them? Is there anything about medicine that you've learned from these yeah. healers? Your, your name is, is Christian? Christian. Yeah, I'm Scott. Um, yeah, I, it's interesting. Um, there's um, there's a, oh, Hippocrates quote when it says, when uh, those who love medicine will love each other. And Batuza, this elderly witch doctor, and I became very close friends. And, until she got run over and died a couple of years ago. That was really a bummer. But her son-in-law, Warren, I'm really close with. Have we tried to change their practices? No, we will try with the Zabino infant oral mutilation. 
If you go see an Abafumu, a traditional, if you go see a Western doctor, he's looking, I don't have my computer, he's looking at a computer, he's not looking at you, he's banging away, he's got 10 minutes, right? And if you talk too much, he's shutting you off. How long does the average doctor listen to a patient before he interrupts? 12 seconds. Oh, these are videos. This is proven. And Abafumu will sit down next to you. How are you doing? Good. <laughs> and they will talk to you. A lot of hands-on stuff, spending time where you feel like you're being heard. Can doctors in America, maybe even some nurses here, learn from that? Yeah. So it's very relationship-oriented with the Abafumu, whereas doctors tend to be clinical and goal-oriented, knock off an antibiotic, give them a you know, something for their cholesterol and tell them to come back in three months. Um, but the Abafu, I think that's been the main thing as far as the herbs. I've taken an ethnobotanist in the forest along with the Abafumu and the ethnobotanist from the U.S. said that only 10% of their, what they use medicinally has ever been described medically. So there's a whole wealth of information in the forest that is still, you know, a little obscure to the Western eye. Do they have things that work? No question. They do. They do. Uh, some of the things they do are a little weird. Um, they have an herb that they like. If you've made your wife really angry, um, you can put a little herb in, um, in the food and cook up a food, and then she becomes quite amorous afterwards. Um, and I noticed one, um, one older guy, when we went on a tour, had a bunch of that in his backpack on going home. <laughs> so how well it works, I, I don't know. <laughs> But there is, we have this camaraderie where we work well together. We're going to upgrade it. Uh, they have some IT guys in here. We're going to work UT Dallas, the Village Health Promoters. Many of those have cell phones. They can call in things. They could send in information to our hospital. It'll reach our medical records. We can uh, compile them. If there's an epidemic or something, if something's happening next to the forest, we will know about it. A woman in extremis on the way, we will know about it. And just improving communications. Can you work with people that have dissimilar practices and learn from each other? I sure hope so. And I think, I think we're doing a pretty good job of it. We have fun. One of the things that we do with the Abafumu is always, we always break bread together, we have sodas together, and we dance. So if you're in contentious meetings here, remember that. Sodas, dance, breaking bread and you'll forget about whatever differences you have. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes? I have a question. I think until you get whatever direction you think might be helpful. Um, thank you for speaking. It's incredible just to see your range of interests and projects and of what you've accomplished with people. Um, yeah, no one's mentioned governance today. So do you have any comments on kind of strengthening the local regional government in Uganda? And you mean governance? Governance here or in Uganda? <laughs> yeah. I, I, that's a complicated question. The Uganda government for the first time is supporting our hospital in a manner that they should. Uh, it used to be about 94% uh, was donor driven and now it's about 60% and we're looking to make it 40%. The Uganda government, the health insurance scheme, other uh, little projects around has helped. As a quick response, I'm going to talk about this at the HIV talk. What does Jesse Helms, Bono, and, and George W. have in common? Man, you guys are all over it. Yeah, that's right. You're right, Pat. They, um, Jesse Helms met with George W. and said, you need to invite Bono to the Oval Office. And George W. said, I don't even like his music. And, but he invited him. <laughs> And so Bono convinced George W. to take on HIV. And George W. came out after the meeting, went to Congress and said, 250 million, the U.S. will contribute toward HIV in Sub-Saharan Africa. Other countries join in. 
no takers. Goes back to Congress, comes back half a billion, 500 million bucks. U.S. will contribute. Come on, no takers. Goes back to Congress, comes back out and says, we need to do that. And here was, that was the quote, as much has been given, much is required. The U.S. will give $15 billion for HIV relief and, and TB relief in Sub-Saharan Africa. Largest amount of money ever appropriated in any time period for any one disease in the history of mankind. And it transformed a lot of healthcare delivery in Sub-Saharan Africa. I think that's George W.'s legacy. Um, so I, it, and it's been an incredible program. We're still reaping some of the benefits of that. Uh, Money's kind of drying up a bit, but it really transformed healthcare delivery. So the U.S. has been involved and still is involved. Uh, you know, people argue about how much uh, Americans, Americans, America gives to uh, foreign nations. Um, that figure should be looked at because that's about, of the money that goes to support projects, about 20% is is American government. Eighty percent is the American people. I can tell you the American people are the most generous people on the face of the planet by far. They give more for projects than any other country in the world. And I, for me it just reduces me to tears. Jim Jameson, Steve Wolf. I met him over a beer one night at a lodge and said, what do you need? And I, we went down a list and he said, what about a nursing school? I said, well, ah. I really thought about it. How much did it cost? I said, I don't know, 150000 uh, Well, it turns out when all said and done, they contributed about three quarters of a million and paid for Jane to go back and get her master's. There's two guys that just came. Un I did not know them until that, that over, over dinner one night, and they met Jane. I mean, that kind of generosity just knocks your socks off. Oh, by the way, they said they liked your lecture. I sent them a little clip. <laughs> So that's the type of relationship, it's person to person, that really makes a difference. Uh, I've had donors that have come and have donated a substantial amount of money. I say, why do you do it? And they say, I do it for myself because I need, my soul needs to be open to this type of work. And they do. Uh, you know, when we have folks, we have tourists that come trek the gorilla and they come over to the hospital. And uh, I take them on tours of the hospital and take them around, all the different things. I, last place I take them is a malnutrition unit. And I'll pick up one of those marasmic kids, and you know, kind of like a little butterfly kid, as weightless, and put them in their hands. And, and they'll say, uh, how old is this kid? And I don't know, four or five. Um, and you can see, you know, it's kind of ding. The whole world view shifts. And they say, this should not be allowed to happen. And you say, yeah, it should not. You can be part of the solution, whether it's here or back in your community. But yes, it should not be allowed to happen. So I, I have tremendous respect for, I mean, I have a little problem with the current government. I'm sorry. But, um, but I have tremendous respect for Americans and for what America has done to Sub-Saharan Africa. I can tell you, if you come to Sub-Saharan Africa, the relation between America and Uganda is impeccable. You tell them if you're American, you will be held. Right, Jane? They like Americans because Americans have been very, very good uh, to Uganda and Sub-Saharan Africa. Yes? All right, thank you, guys. <laughs> God bless.